Good morning, Mr. Chairman, distinguished members of our committee. Uh, I also want to take a moment and thank Stephen Bassett for giving me the honor of offering testimony here this morning. I was only uh, scheduled here uh, to do this yesterday afternoon, so my opening statement is a bit rough at the edges. I've been involved in the field of UFO studies for more than 30 years. As a researcher, lecturer, activist, consultant, author, and conference organizer. I've consulted to numerous television and radio shows, films, appear on radio regularly commenting about these subjects, write a column, uh, actually uh, a new one that will be starting in June for a, uh, a new online magazine called UFO Truth, published by my friend and colleague to my right, Gary Haseltine. I'm also um, the co-author of a 540-page book that was a bestseller in the United Kingdom entitled um, Left at East Gate, a first-hand account of the Rendlesham Forest UFO investigation, uh, Rendlesham Forest UFO incident, its cover-up and investigation. For these 30 years that I have pursued this subject, I have done it on a number of fronts, always doing my utmost to approach each new case, witness claim, research paper, or interview free of prejudice or agenda. My only objective being to get myself and my readers as close as possible to the truth of what I've been looking into, limited only by my investigative skills, means, and uh, applying as much common sense as possible wherever possible. Before proceeding, however, uh, I feel I should go on, put on the record um, that I am self-trained as an investigative writer. And if anyone in these hearings has a, a background more opposite than my friend and colleague Peter Davenport, it's me. Uh, I began my professional life as a uh, painter and film historian. I taught painting in New York City for many years at my alma mater, the School of Visual Arts. And as I developed as a writer, I supported myself uh, continuing as an artist, as a uh, manager of a distinguished repertory theater company in New York City, as a New York City tour guide, and as a copywriter. I also worked for eight of those years as an online phone volunteer and shift supervisor on the busiest crisis intervention and suicide hotline in the United States. Some may feel that such an eclectic and decidedly unrelated background may not be much of an asset in the field I ultimately choose to pursue. Um, I can only beg to differ. Subjects I've chosen to investigate have included but not been limited to the origins of the UFO ridicule factor, roadblocks on the path to disclosure, the United Kingdom's Rendlesham Forest incident, the strange death of James Vincent Forrestal, first Secretary of Defense, as some of you know, and an early casualty of UFO secrecy. At least that are my conclusions. Critical thinking, deductive reasoning and ufology, stress and UFO studies, the UFO abduction phenomena, and UFOs, organized religion, and fundamentalist thinking. As this morning's discussion topic is listed as various topics, I believe I qualify. <laughs> While I stand ready to try and answer any questions to the best of my ability this committee may have, I'd particularly like to invite you to focus in on two of these particular areas of study. One, the so-called UFO ridicule factor. We now know for a fact the subject of UFOs and their implications have been regarded as extremely serious by our military and intelligence communities from at least the summer of 1947 on. More seriously, in fact, than any other matter facing this nation since the end of World War II. Why then have the overwhelming majority, and uh, Mr. Davenport hit the nail on the head, we divide uh, the media's uh, general relationship with the subject of UFOs into two areas. Local and regional news gatherers are overall very serious, inquisitive, and genuinely respectful of this mystery. Major media 
has singled this subject out for a level of ridicule, sarcasm, and condescension matched in post-war journalism. How and why did all of this come to pass? And what is its legacy for the American people? The second subject is one you were introduced to during yesterday morning's hearings. That is the UK's Rendlesham Forest UFO incident. I first heard of these events uh, in the autumn of 1983, shortly after the story broke in Great Britain. The following year, I met and chatted briefly with Larry Warren, the former United States Air Force security police officer who had, completely on his own, and to a degree at great risk, certainly to his peace of mind and character, uh, become the whistleblower in this case, was directly responsible for the FOIA that resulted in the release of Colonel Halt's January 1981 report, which was then published in England in 83 and the story broke. Four years later, we met again at a conference not far from here at American University in Washington. Uh, I was very impressed with his presentation fully authentic military witnesses who can be fully vetted and prove their involvement are not all that common. You've had the uh, privilege of hearing several of them yesterday afternoon. I decided I wanted to interview this guy. He decided after hearing me on a panel discussion, he wanted me to co-author a book with him. We met the next weekend, we talked all weekend, and by that Sunday afternoon, we shook hands, and I was very excited. I was going to be writing a book. I was looking for a serious project to get my teeth into. I thought it might take a year or two, uh, obviously result in a huge bestseller, a movie deal, many checks to endorse, and women to fight off. Life does not always work out the way you think. The book took 10 years to complete. It cost us everything we had. It cost me, to a great degree, my peace of mind. It's brought me back to England since more than 20 times. I had no idea what I was getting into. But when we completed it, it was a bestseller in the United Kingdom. It was immediately in the library of the then new uh, Prime Minister, Tony Blair. One of our greatest champions in the United Kingdom became uh, uh, former Admiral of the Fleet, former Chief of Staff of the Ministry of Defense, Lord Peter Hill Norton who, as an MP, brought his hardcover copy onto the book of the floor of House of Lords and confronted the then uh, Secretary for Defense with four questions taken right out of the book, all of which were demurred. Um, when my co-author lost his passport, the State Department refusing to renew it for, quote, unquote, speaking out on sensitive defense issues in a public forum on foreign soil, it was nobody less than former Attorney General Ramsey Clark, who pro bono helped us restore Larry's passport and continue our work. The men who were involved in this as witnesses, and it was only touched on yesterday, were put through absolute hell. Some of the things that were done to them were unconscionable as far as I'm concerned. And this is of more interest and focus for me than whatever the source of the intelligence is behind the events of December 1980. I applaud John and Jim for fighting for uh, the truth to come out about this. I think all of these men are still struggling. And in fact, we are all clear in former deputy base commanders, uh, Charles Halt's terminology, that these men were meddled with. And in some cases are still sorting out implanted memories from actual ones. Hence comes a certain amount of contention within this case that continues 33 years after. I hope I can clarify some of it fast. And again, uh, thank you for the privilege of appearing before you. Good. <clears throat>